Psalm 28 of David. Lord, I call to you. My rock, do not be deaf to me. If you remain silent to me, I'll be like those going down to the pit. Listen to the sound of my pleading when I cry to you for help, when I lift up my hands to your holy sanctuary. Do not drag me away with the wicked, with evildoers who speak friendly ways with their neighbours while malice is in their hearts. Repay them according to what they have done, according to the evil of their deeds. Repay them according to the work of their hands. Give them back what they deserve, because they do not consider what the Lord has done or the work of his hands. He will tear them down and not rebuild them. Blessed be the Lord, for he has heard the sound of my pleading. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him and I am helped. Therefore, my heart celebrates and I give thanks to him with my song. The Lord is the strength of his people. He is a stronghold of salvation for his anointed. Save your people. Bless your possession. Shepherd them and carry them forever. This is the word of the Lord. As we come to think about what that verse has to say to us here today in Narrabri, let's come before God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it is living and active. And we pray that you'll give us ears to hear, hearts to understand, and the will to put into practice what you have to say to us today. Amen. Have you ever been stuck in a situation where it felt like God was a long way away? When it felt like no one was listening to your prayers and you just didn't know what was going on? This is a situation that most of us find ourselves in at one point in our life. And the amazing thing about the Bible is it doesn't ignore those situations. It doesn't pretend they don't happen. It doesn't pretend we don't feel that way. Instead, it speaks directly to it and says, when you feel that way, here is what you need to know to fight that feeling. As we start reading Psalm 28, as we look at it, David is feeling particularly abandoned by God. He feels like he needs God help, and God is just not showing up. And so he's waiting for God to show up and to help him as he said he would. But by the end of the psalm, he's still praising God with a loud voice. And so as we read this psalm, we'll see how David can navigate these feelings and still come out the other side, praising God with his song. So David is stuck in a situation. He needs rescuing. He cries out to God, feels like God is not listening. But you see... His situation is more dire than just being surrounded by enemies with the fear of death on his mind. Have a look with me at verse 3. Do not drag me away with the wicked. David is not just facing death and shame and ruin. He's facing the prospect of being God's enemy forever. God considers him one of the wicked. And so he's feeling rather helpless and alone right now. But as we keep reading, we hit verses 4 and 5, and they feel a little bit unsettling, don't they? Repay them according to what they have done. Repay them according to the work of their hands. These verses aren't right. God's people are supposed to be forgiving and loving. We shouldn't be seeking vengeance on our enemies. How on earth can David say this and still be considered righteous? What's going on? And to an extent, the people of God shouldn't be using words like this. Whenever we take vengeance into our own hands, all too often it's selfish, disproportionate, and unjust. But God says something rather interesting all the way back in Deuteronomy chapter 32. He says, vengeance vengeance belongs to me. I will repay. You see, God is perfectly holy and perfectly just. He is the only one capable of dispensing true and perfect justice in this world. 
And so when we say that Christians are not to be people who seek vengeance and petty maliciousness, well, that's true. But God, however, who is perfectly just, who isn't selfish, who isn't given to passive aggressiveness, he's the one who can seek vengeance on behalf of his people. He's the one who can bring true justice. And so David is doing something rather helpful. He's taking his feelings of anger and bitterness and giving them to God and saying, God, I am not capable of dealing with this. Please deal with this for me. Please bring justice for me. And that's the perfect place for those feelings. It takes away the temptation that we face to become passive-aggressive, malicious, or to take vengeance into our own hands. No, instead, we give those situations to the God who is able to bring perfect justice, whether in this life or in the next, and we allow him to work, to work through our selfishness, to work through our maliciousness, and to take matters into his own hands. There may be times and situations in life when we will need to go to the police or various other authorities that God has has instituted over us in order to bring justice in this life. But ultimately, the right to vengeance and justice belongs to God alone because he is perfect and holy and one who is able to bring justice without the threat of selfishness and vindictiveness. And so words like this that we see all throughout the Psalms are helpful reminds us to give our feelings of anger and bitterness to God and let him take vengeance for us. Because when he comes again, we will be vindicated by him. But then, by verse 6 and verse 7, David's tune has changed. May the Lord be praised. He has heard the sound of my pleading. God is not as distant as David thought he was. David is not forgotten by God. There will be justice for him and for God's people. David has seen the answer to his prayer and so he can praise God. And then, from that place, David makes one final request of God. Shepherd and carry your people forever. David was stuck waiting for God to come, waiting for God to show up and deal with the situation. He was waiting for salvation. Then, a thousand years later, God's people are echoing David's cry for help. They've lost their land. They're ruled by a vindictive, evil dictator who is not kind to their religion. They feel abandoned by the God who brought them out of Egypt, rejected by the God who rescued them. Then, one night, in a Bethlehem stable, an infant's cry is heard for the first time. David asked, in verse 9, God to shepherd and carry his people. And in those newborn cries, God says, Here is my answer. Here is how I will shepherd and carry my people forever. Because this is no ordinary child. This is God himself come to walk amongst his people. We're up to point two on the outline. As this child, Jesus, grew, he walked in our pain walked through the dirt and muck that is life. He knew sickness. He cried at the death of his friend. And just like David, his ancestor before him, he felt the heartache of being separated from God. We see that most clearly in our reading from Luke 22. Then, he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and began to pray. Father, if you are willing, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel appeared from heaven to strengthen him. 
Being in anguish, he prayed more fervently, and his sweat became like drops of blood falling to the ground. Jesus knew the pain of a fervent prayer answered with a no. The cup was not taken away from him. There was no other way. Unlike David, he was dragged away with the wicked. He went down to the pit. But then, three days after his prayer, God revealed his triumph by raising him from the dead. And now, along with David, he can say with confidence, my heart trusts in him and I am helped. Jesus did what we could not. He trusted his father, even to the point of a horrifying death on a Roman cross. And because he trusted in God, even in his suffering, even when God felt distant, he was helped. He was raised from the dead triumphant. And he went through that so that we wouldn't have to. God answered his prayer with a no so his people could always come to him in prayer, no matter the situation. Jesus was dragged away and given a grave with the wicked so that his people could always be called God's friend and would never have to face death. Jesus felt abandoned by God so that his people would never have to be, so that he could be their shepherd forever. And just like our memory verse says, if we trust in him, we will be helped. We now come to point three on our outline. Psalm 23 has very dis- three very distinct feelings in it. In the first part of the psalm, David is feeling distant from God, forgotten by him. Then he moves to anger and cries out to God for justice, for the injustices committed against him. And then in the final part of the psalm, David sees God's help. He praises God for his help and his victory. The amazing thing is Jesus lived through the abandonment and through the injustice so that we could join with David and praise God with our song and say our memory verse together. If we trust in him, he will help us. He will shepherd and carry us forever. There will be times in our lives when God feels distant, when it feels like we're surrounded by enemies and God just isn't listening. But just because it feels that way doesn't mean it's true. God has not abandoned us. And when we're stuck, when it feels like God has abandoned us, we just need to remember the Christmas story. God didn't have to come to earth. God was under no obligation to come to earth. God the Son was born as Jesus the man because he chose to be, because he wanted to be with us. He gave up everything. He gave up the glories of heaven, his place at the right hand of God, to come and walk with us walk amongst us and be with us. And if he was willing to do all that for us, you can be sure that he hasn't given up on us yet. He has not abandoned us. In fact, he went as far as he could to show us that that will never be the case. And so, like David, we were waiting for rescue. And God himself showed up to rescue us. He does not ignore our cries for help. He walks with us through our storms so that we can say, God has brought me this far. Because of what Jesus has done, we will not be dragged away with the wicked. This is why Christmas is such a great time of year. It reminds us that God has not forgotten us. God is not ignoring us, but he has heard our cry. He will be with us. And we will one day live with him 
forever. If, like David, you're feeling like you're the victim of a great injustice and all you want to do is take vengeance, bring your situation to God. Let him deal with it for you. Let him take your anger and bitterness. If you need to, if it's a legal issue, feel free to go the, to the police. God has instituted all the authorities. That's what they're there for, to bring about a small measure of his justice on earth. But first and foremost, go to God. Let him help you deal with those feelings and trust him that he will bring true and perfect justice when he comes again to vindicate his people. Because of all this, because we know God has not abandoned us, because we know he hears our prayer, because we know he will bring true and perfect justice, just like David, we always have a reason to praise God. Because of what he's done for us, we can celebrate. We can say that God has heard my prayer. He has heard our cries for help. That's why we sing in church every week. We trust in him, and he is our help and our shield, and so we praise him with our song. This is why our memory verse is so important. It digs right down into our heart and reminds us we are not abandoned by God. He has come near to us. And so, even in the darkest night, there is a reason to praise God for what he has done for us in Jesus. God has heard our prayers. He has not left us. David's prayer has been answered. He will shepherd and carry us forever until the day that we join with him in the new heavens and the new earth and he walks amongst his people once more. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you that at Christmas you remind us that you have not abandoned us. We thank you that you heard and answered David's cry and we thank you that you hear and answer all our cries for help. Be with us this week and help us to trust in you so that we may praise you with our song. Amen. Any questions? Yeah. Um, Um, I don't think he, so the question is, why does David change so suddenly from saying, where is God, to saying, oh, praise God? I think this was probably written kind of after his situation had ended and he's reflecting back on it and saying, hey, God did answer my prayer. And so the, the gap between those verses is could be a considerable length of time. It's just not reflected in how he's written his poem.